Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Oscilloscope Probing Best Practices. In this presentation, we'll explain the most important tips and tricks for selecting and using different types of oscilloscope probes. The eight tips we'll cover in this presentation are compensating passive probes, using a short ground lead, selecting the correct input impedance, zeroing and degaussing current probes, increasing current measurement sensitivity using multiple loops, de-skewing probes for power measurements, making floating measurements using differential probes, and using active probes for demanding measurement applications. Let's start with passive probe compensation. Passive probes contain both a fixed parallel RC network in the probe tip, as well as a variable compensation capacitance, usually at the scope attachment point. Probe compensation involves adjusting this variable capacitance in order to cancel out or compensate for the inherent input capacitance of a scope. Properly compensating passive probes is important for obtaining the best possible accuracy and or linearity in measurement results. Most oscilloscopes have a built-in 1000 Hz square wave generator for probe compensation. Square or rectangular waves are used for probe compensation because they have both high frequency and low frequency components. The probe tip is connected to the signal source and the probe ground lead is connected to ground. The oscilloscope is then configured to display the probe compensation output. A non-conductive tool is inserted into the small hole in the probe compensation box and this tool is rotated in order to adjust the probe's capacitance such that the displayed square wave is as rectangular as possible. A probe is properly compensated when the tops of the displayed compensation signal are essentially horizontal. Overcompensated probes create overshoot on the leading edge of the signal, and undercompensated probes cause undershoot on the leading edge. As mentioned a moment ago, the compensation capacitor is adjusted until the waveform has rectangular edges. This usually only takes a small fraction of a turn. Another important tip when using passive probes is to use the shortest ground connection possible. Passive probes are single-ended, which means they measure voltage relative to ground, and thus need a ground connection. For passive probes, this ground connection is usually made via a ground lead with an alligator clip, but it's important to keep this lead as short as possible. Longer ground leads add inductance to the measured signal. This inductance affects higher frequency components and can lead to ringing and or over and undershoot in square wave type signals. Note that when a ground point is available near the measurement point, a slip-on spring style ground lead can be used to minimize the length of the ground connection. Next we'll talk about setting the channel input impedance. Some oscilloscopes allow the user to select between a 50 ohm and a 1 mega ohm input impedance or termination. This is configured through the scope interface on a per-channel basis. The standard input impedance for an oscilloscope input is 1 mega ohm, and this is the proper setting when using passive probes. The optional 50 ohm termination is most often used when probing with so-called active probes, or when directly connecting the instrument using a BNC cable. Many test and measurement instruments and RF devices use 50 ohms as their standard termination. It's important to choose the correct input impedance since the wrong input impedance can affect the measured signal amplitude. For example, seeing twice the expected voltage when the termination is set to 1 mega ohm instead of 50 ohms. In addition, the maximum safe input voltage is often much lower when the termination is set to 50 ohms instead of 1 mega ohm. Some scopes don't have native support for a 50 ohm termination. But in this case, a special feed-through adapter can be used when a 50 ohm termination is needed. Our next two tips involve current probes, which produce an output voltage that's proportional to the amount of measured current. Ideally, a current probe should show a zero ampere current reading when no current is present. But due to temperature and other environmental conditions, the zero value of a current probe may change over time. This can, and should, be corrected using something called zero adjustment or zeroing. There are two different ways in which to zero a current probe. 
For probes with a non-proprietary interface, a zero offset knob or wheel is usually built into the probe itself. We'll see a picture of this on the next slide. Probes with a proprietary interface usually allow zeroing to be performed using the scope menu or controls. And some scopes even have an auto zero function, which will apply the correct offset amount and direction automatically. For best accuracy, it's always a good idea to zero current probes before making any current measurements. The ferromagnetic core of a current probe may retain some magnetism or flux, even when there's no current present. This is not uncommon after a probe has been used to measure a current that was being switched on and off. This residual magnetism can lead to the creation of an offset and impact measurement results. Most current probes, therefore, support a demagnetizing or degauss function that can be launched either from the probe itself or via the scope's user interface. A special waveform is generated such that it creates an essentially random magnetic field that erases any residual magnetism in the probe. This is normally a very quick process that only takes a few seconds. Therefore, whenever using current probes, it's a good idea to demagnetize or degauss the probe both before zeroing as well as before making measurements. Another tip regarding current probes is how to increase current measurement sensitivity. One technique used to improve measurement sensitivity is looping the conductor through the probe multiple times. The sensitivity of the probe increases linearly with the number of loops. Looping the conductor through the opening four times improves sensitivity by a factor of four. Since the scope has no way to know how many times the conductor has been looped, an appropriate scaling value must be manually entered into the scope. These loops also increase the insertion impedance by the square of the number of loops. So four loops would increase the insertion impedance by a factor of 16. However, this increased insertion impedance is usually still quite small and does not significantly affect measurements at low current levels. Current probes are often used together with voltage probes when making power measurements, since power measurements require simultaneous measurement of both voltage and current. In some cases, a time offset or skew may exist between the measured voltage and measured current waveforms due to different propagation times in the probe leads. And this skew can lead to incorrect power results. Special D-skew fixtures are used to detect and compensate for skew by generating time-aligned voltage and current pulses. These pulses are simultaneously measured using attached current and voltage probes. If these test waveforms are skewed, an appropriate D-skew or time offset value can be entered on the scope in order to bring the current and voltage waveforms back into phase and improve the accuracy of power measurements. Another special type of measurement is differential measurements. As mentioned earlier, oscilloscope probes normally measure voltage with respect to ground. This is called a single-ended measurement. But there are many cases where we want to make a differential measurement, in which we measure a voltage between two points, neither of which is connected to ground. These are also sometimes called floating measurements. One way of doing this is by using two single-ended probes. We measure with respect to ground at two points, and then subtract these voltages within the scope. This is often referred to as a quasi-differential measurement. A better approach is using a differential probe, which has an internal differential amplifier and which produces a voltage that corresponds to the difference between the voltages at the two connection points. There are many reasons why differential probes are the best choice for floating measurements. In addition to being able to measure voltage between any two points, differential probes can provide higher accuracy since they reject common mode noise, that is, noise that's common to both inputs. They also help protect both devices, as well as human operators, from high currents created by an accidental or inadvertent ground connection. Our last probing tip is when to use active probes. As the name implies, active probes have powered components, in this case a field effect transistor, or FET, in the probe tip. The design of active probes means that they have much lower input capacitance than passive probes, usually a picofarad or less,
compared to tens of picofarads for passive probes. This lower capacitance has two major advantages. The first is reduced circuit loading, which allows for a more faithful reproduction of the measured signal on the scope, and a lower impact on circuit operation. The other is higher bandwidth, which is needed for more accurate measurement of higher speed signals, and, in particular, of signals with high frequency components, such as square or pulsed waves. In addition, some active probes can also apply a relatively large offset to the signal, which is very useful when trying to measure small AC signals on top of large DC signals, such as power supply ripple. Active probes are therefore an excellent choice for demanding measurement applications. Let's end with a brief summary. In this presentation, we covered eight basic probing tips. Compensating passive probes, using the shortest possible ground leads, selecting the correct input impedance, degaussing and zeroing current probes, using multiple windings to increase current measurement sensitivity, de-skewing voltage and current probes for power measurements, using differential probes for floating or non-ground reference measurements, and using active probes for more challenging measurement applications. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Oscilloscope Probing Best Practices. If you'd like to learn more about how to use oscilloscopes or oscilloscope probes, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.